cool. That's technically rolling. We're all set here. That's technically rolling. They're gonna annoy me, but they look decent in camera, maybe. Hello. I've never, <laughs> I've never tried these like green things in front of the camera, so we'll see. Um, you're doing your best Kevin impression already. <laughs> um, yeah, hell like, yeah. <laughs> that's so funny you say that. <laughs> uh, episode 46, Brandon Osborne is here, also known right. as Boomer, more commonly known as Boomer. Uh, episode 46, something from everyone. So we're actually at a c- cool time here. We are just talking about the show and kind of how the studio has grown over time. This is actually just about one year since the first episode today. So the first episode was oh, wow. the 23rd of November, and this will be out tomorrow Whatever that is, the 20th, the 19th, something like that. Yeah, yeah so um, around a year. Whatever, yeah. A couple clo- days off. As but close as I'm going to be. Yeah, this will um, be the one year, though. It is, it is. <laughs> so 46 in a year. It's been a fun fun little journey, and I'm excited to keep this bitch growing. My next milestone is 100 episodes by 2025. Yeah. Uh, so I've basically got to do one a week for the next couple of years, and we'll, or next year, uh, and we'll be there. So we're That's in so progress, sick. dude. I appreciate you coming by to celebrate today. Thank you for having um, me. Before we get into stuff, uh, yeah, what does Euclid have coming up? Anything people should know about? Any shows coming up? Merch coming up? Music videos? Music? Anything people should know about before we dive into the fun stuff? Um, well, as far as that goes, the shows, uh, there's one show coming up that I will unfortunately not be able to attend. Uh, that is in New Jersey uh, with, uh, sorry, I got to get my phone out for this again. Uh, let's see. That's New Jersey. Oh, that's going to be Signs of the Swarm. Uh, face yourself. Ooh, this show. Yes, Enoch yes. and uh, I think uh, Knights of Malice. That's yes. a wild lineup. Yeah, it's gonna be. Yeah, family game. stuff going on. Something, something exciting or something sad. <laughs> Uh, what's that? Is something like exciting, like a fun, re- like going to a wedding, or is it like something? Oh no, uh, I ha- actually have a, I have a tour with that weekend with uh, Edict. Oh hell yeah! Okay, yeah. and we're gonna be touring with uh, Aretha Tongues. Cool. Yeah, dude. And you also playing guitar in Edict? I play bass in Edict. Bass. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Edict and Euclid are the two. I know Shape Thor was in the mix for a little bit, but I know we got yeah, just these two going now. Yep. Is definitely. that the current current scoop? Pull it just a little bit closer to you, or pull it down a little bit, oh, or slide your chair in, whichever whichever feels right to you. Okay. Um, I'm just like. No, <laughs> you can't tell me that. <laughs> so Whatever makes you feel good. Uh, um, right. My quick little plug is I am booking music videos for 2024. So anyone interested in music videos, let's let's talk now. We got this year filled up, and it's been another good year. Mm-hmm. Trying to do even better next year. Let's keep it growing. Let's keep having more fun. Uh, um, hell yeah, dude. Where does Boomer come from? So everyone knows you as Boomer. It took me. I had to do some like real research to find your full name of Brandon Osborne. Everything oh was yeah, Boomer Brandon Osmosis. I think was in the midst for a while. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where does Boomer come from? Uh, well, it's a family name. My brother couldn't say my name when uh, he was younger, so like him and I are a couple years apart. So like when I was just born, he was like about one and a half, two years old. So like him trying to say Brandon yep. just came out as Boomer. That's and then, funny. Yeah. I don't know how that happens. I wish, like, my parents could tell me more, but, like, that's literally all they told me. <laughs> See, that's way more flattering. My sister's name is Paulina. She's yeah. three years older, and I couldn't say it growing up, so she became Nana to me. Oh. And she's still Nana. <laughs> so, like, But, it, just... like, Boomer is, like, a cool name. I say Nana, and I almost feel, like, self-conscious now. It's like, she's not my aunt. Like, she's my sister. She's three years older than me. Yeah, like, yeah. I should say Paulina. <laughs> but calling her Paulina feels so foreign, because it's like, I've... Yeah, for the first 18 years of my life, I never even thought about it. And now as an adult, <laughs> it's like, hang on, this is, yeah, not what her name is at all. But yeah, at least Boomer, like, sounds like a cool nickname. It sounds like, yeah, you were playing baseball and someone's like, oh, Boomer, and it yeah. stuck. But no, as a brother who couldn't speak at all. <laughs> no, exactly, yeah. And then it kind of just, like, adapted with everything I did because, like, uh, my family, like, my brother would say my nickname and then, like, while I was, like, trying to play sports, was like, oh, Boomer, oh, like, you know, like, you were just saying, like, baseball and stuff, it kind of, like, fits together it and does. stuff, so, like, football, whatever, yeah, you know, kind of sort of thing. I assumed it was something like that. I assumed you were the biggest third grader, and you were just known for stuffing, the, like, the A-gap on the football field. <laughs> well, that's not false, so I definitely was okay. the biggest third grader. <laughs> Hell yeah. So that's where this thing starts. So, uh, are you playing music this time, or are you just bruising kids on the football field, and music comes in later in life? Um, so, I never really got into sports until probably, like, maybe late junior your high school, like in my whole senior year. And like the whole time up until then was just playing music and just like wanted to like be in bands and stuff like that, you know? That feels backwards. I would assume yeah. you grew up playing sports, then got into music, but it was, you played music your whole life and then kind of got into sports right at the end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Where does the music part of this start then? Uh, my dad gave me a lot of influence, like playing when I was growing up and stuff like that. He would like play acoustic for like me and my brother and stuff. Got you. And like when he was like around my age, he would be like doing all the touring and stuff like that. And he grew up in Utah. So like he was like touring up through like um, Wyoming, you know, down through Nevada and like 
you know, it's pretty pretty cool like stories that he's told me. So it's like that's kind of like cool. inspirational to do that kind of stuff now. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to ask about the scope of your dad's touring, but quickly, my my tangent as you were describing that is like touring. I never even thought about being a local band out there and how much it would suck compared to being a local band here. Just in that, like Boston and New York are six hours from each other, right? And like right. Philadelphia, six more hours. Jersey's a couple hours. We we're just talking about. We got Maine, but out there, it's like they're tour date, like being a. We always talk about it, it's like traveling through that area as a touring band. And I never even thought about being the local band in Utah, yeah. where it's like everything <laughs> is eight hours. There is nothing that is close by. Like how much more challenging that would be to start anything and get a venture going. Exactly. And like being a local band back then, like there wasn't really a lot of original music being played. Sure. Like a lot of the bands were just like trying to either like play covers mm -hmm. at like a lot of like biker bars and stuff and like dive bars and stuff because like out there, it really pretty much was just like open land and like farmland and stuff like that in like the 60s and 70s. So, yep. and like it's a little bit more developed now, but like it still has a lot of open land. So, interesting. The yeah. South feels similar to me, and I have friends in the South uh, and uh, in Louisiana it's out specifically. West. Uh, the similarity here. Oh, oh okay. Is, I thought you were saying, like, oh, yeah, that's something like, nah, bro. Yes, Utah, right next to Florida, my favorite southern yeah. state, right along the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, yes. Utah. <laughs> Duh. Do you Hell even yeah, know bro. how maps work, bro? Um, nah, dude. No, it's just not like the, the bar scene, the dive bar thing where you can like still make a living playing music in a way that I guess you could up here, but it's not quite the same thing where like you right. can be in a cover band and get booked every night of the week and make good money each night mm -hmm. of the week doing this thing. Yeah. And it sounds like you're describing, yeah, some more dive bar culture out there that existed in in the yeah. southern Utah. Right, yeah, in southern Utah, you know, brother, down oh. south next to, you know, Virginia. Uh, Utah uh, was in the Civil War, dude. That was a crazy Yeah, history. dude. I don't know if they were part of the north or the south, you know. They're just kind of in the middle. Hell yeah. yeah. That sounds like a safe road to wander down on a recorded history <laughs> podcast. Um, oh, yeah. How serious is Dad's touring? Um, well, he actually did it for, I don't know, because he was in the Army. And then he did it before the Army. He was kind of doing it while he was in the Army. Um, that sounds like a wild so like yeah i would never see well, yeah music and rv as an overlap it's just well see like from him like growing up playing all the music and stuff like that obviously going to the biker bars and stuff you're more adapt to like get into trouble and like <laughs> sure. cause trouble so like yeah he had to kind of straighten himself out and then did the army and then kind of did like the touring thing very lightly he would like play like uso shows and like play covers and stuff like that with okay. you know but like yeah, like, while he was in the Army, it wasn't too serious. But, like, before that, like, he would just tell me stories about, like, playing biker bars. And, like, they would have to play certain songs for them, like, so they could hear. And, like, if they wanted to hear Credence, they had to have to play, like, two hours of Credence. Yep. And, like, if they wanted to hear Aerosmith. Or else, they, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's just like, I don't fucking want you here anymore, brother. <laughs> it's just like, all right, dude. <laughs> Damn. But, yeah, so it was definitely... I don't know. It's definitely a lot more loose back then than it is now. Absolutely. Wise, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things were. Yeah. yeah dude, um, damn. Okay, cool. So he is in kind of this, uh, not a similar genre to where you are now, but kind mm. of what the 70s version of this genre would be. He's kind of starting to be into rock and metal and kind of experimental music. More Absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Cool. So that is the foundation for you. And then, yeah, how old are you when you get like your first guitar? Is guitar your first instrument? Uh, actually, bass was my first bass. instrument. Bass, okay, yeah. cool. I was inspired by Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers and Fieldy from Korn. Um, just like the whole slapping thing. I was just like, oh, I can slap too. And like literally, like when I first got it, I was just like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> like I didn't know what I was doing, but like I had a good sense of rhythm. So like playing Korn stuff on a standard four string Squire bass, like didn't sound the same, but like the rhythm was there. So mm -hmm. I was just like playing along to the shit. But um, are you like, are you six? Are you ten? Like how old are you? -ish? Um, I was like, I don't know. I was probably around twelve. Okay. Yeah, I was probably around twelve when I got my first bass or instrument, if you will. Hell yeah! And yeah. you're just slapping away at that thing. Are you taking any <laughs> lessons? Is like dad teaching you? Is your older brother? Is older brother, younger brother? Uh, older brother. Older brother. Yeah, because uh, he was older when you were born. Um, is he? Yeah, is he teaching you? Or are you kind of self-taught? Are you just hanging out in your room? Like, what does the learning process look like here? Um, well, it's kind of like weird because I was very good to like I was very good at like listening to stuff and kind of like mimicking it. So music was just kind of like, it just kind of came natural to me. And then like, I would just listen to stuff and then I would just try to like find the right notes to play. Cause like I had like the hand-eye coordination to like play everything. Mm -hmm. So I was just, I don't know. It just kind of came, like, like I said, it just kind of came natural to me and uh, learning. Uh, my brother would kind of teach me some stuff cause he was playing guitar here and there. And then like my dad would like show me like some chords and stuff. Mm -hmm. I probably took a, 
maybe a few months of lessons, but like I didn't really have the attention span to do that. Just sit there and like have yeah. them be like, all right, this. And then they didn't really teach me tabs. They would obviously, when you go to a lesson, they sh show you sheet music. And mm -hmm. I was just like, I really don't know what the fuck this is. <laughs> it's just like literally looked like gibberish to me. So yeah. like trying to do that, I was like, oh, do you have any tabs for that? And they would just look at me like, yeah, here. <laughs> it's <laughs> like asking like, for the spark notes of the book. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, mad. Yeah. Cause yeah. like once tabs started coming out, like I could like read tabs and it was just like, oh, okay, three on the E like four on the a it's just like it came a lot more natural to me and then like yeah. kind of opened up my ear to like just listen more and just like be able to like learn by ear so that's like i have zero ability to do that like learning by ear like i i grew up uh in elementary school and like middle school i was in the orchestra so i can read sheet music like at a very basic level like i understand the gist of it yeah and then when i learned guitar a little bit i taught myself a little bit of guitar like tabs make so much sense like i discovered tabs and was like oh sheet music is never happening in my brain ever i don't yeah. need this it's useless to me <laughs> yeah. in my little little pool of knowledge mm -hmm. um and so tabs make so much sense, but it's interesting to me that, it, yeah, it's like almost frowned upon by someone who like is really into theory and really appreciates and loves the instrument. This thing feels like a, like a spit, right. <laughs> like a it's, stain on the it, instrument. It's just like, yeah, it's just kind of like a tricycle almost. It's, yep. Well, like, um, yeah, like a training bike, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like to have the training wheels on the whole time. It's just like, yeah, I don't want to take them off, you know? Yeah. But <laughs> I it, want the easiest way possible. <laughs> yeah. And the way to make the best thing happen. I've been uh, looking into learning drums and so I've, but an interesting part to me has been like, if I, the first step there is buying an e-kit and that's been really been the holdup to me is just deciding to spend money on that instead of on a camera thing or in something that feels like it's going to generate value for me. Like it feels like a, a waste of money to go buy an e-kit where it's like, I don't know, there's value in learning stuff, but it's not, I'm not joining a band. Like I, that's not what I'm interested yeah, in. Yeah. I'm just interested in getting familiar with it. Um, but in that, I've had also to figure out, like, how do you even learn drums? Like, what would that look like for me? Because I feel like I have no rhythm, which is part of why this is such an enticing challenge to me, where you describe picking up the bass and, like, being able to feel the music. And to me, it's like, I have none of that. If I hear the music and I have the tab in front of me, I can connect A to B. But right. yeah, yeah, hearing yeah. a thing and going, oh, that's a seventh fret, is just like... It feels like a magic trick that I can't even begin to like put together yeah. how they pulled that rabbit out of the like hat. Like the vocabulary to you is like literally gibberish. It's like a second language, but like mm -hmm. seeing it is a lot different. And like that's like easier for me because like learning just in general, like just reading something, it's just kind of like I have to like when I was younger, I would have to like read the line again, like read the sentence again, read over, read over. Mm -hmm. And just like it wouldn't comprehend to me. So like I would just give up on myself. But like if someone were to show me something with their hands, or like, you know, just like, I guess, like, help me, like, walk me through kind of sort of thing. Like, that's, like, more helpful to me. And then, like, instead of just, like, reading something, obviously. So was guitar or bass, was it, like, the first, like, aha moment where you start to recognize the style of learning in you? Like, up until this point, I assume you've been, yeah, in math class and been like, fuck, this isn't how I learn something. Mm -hmm. Is bass the first thing you pick up and go, oh, this is how I learn? Like, is it the first, like, breath of fresh air for you? Yeah, so, like, even before, like, I started playing instruments, like, I would just, like, like I said, like, my dad would, like, play songs for, like, me and my brother or whatever, just, like, jam for us. And, like, I would, like, pick up a pool stick and I would mimic what my dad was doing. Mm -hmm. So, like, if whatever he was doing, like, I don't care. I would hold the pool stick and I would start going like this. Yeah. So, I guess that cat's kind of, like, where my rhythm developed. Yep. And then after that, like, just dancing with my mom and, like, dancing with my dad being a younger kid. Like, you know, just, like, doing whatever, just being a goofball, like... I guess that's where my rhythm developed. And then, like, it just, everything else just kind of came natural to me. Mm -hmm. And then, like I was telling you earlier, I started listening to rap. So, like, that's, like, a good bass rhythm to start out. And then I kind of just went into metal. And then just, like, metal just kind of took over everything else because I like metal a lot more. So That's interesting. I'm yeah. always baffled that, like, yeah, you loved music and that's where you got into it. And I feel like I... I liked music, but I've never been interested. Like, I've learned to play it enough, but, like, I've never been interested in, like, the how or the why that I feel like is so innate to you. Yeah, and It's yeah. an interesting, like, totally different perspective on loving the same thing, but from totally, yeah, polar mm -hmm. opposite perspectives there. Um, hell yeah. So then when does this start to get, like, real for you? So you're, yeah, 12-ish learning instruments. Uh, when are you, like, joining a first band? When is this thing you playing at a talent show? Like, when <laughs> is this thing first, like, starting to leave the bedroom and leave the basement and become something that's a little bit more public and... So that's something you're proud of. Or that you uh, can be proud of at the time, at least. Well, it was like honestly, like I can't, I, I can't really like remember everything, but it's dude, like what the hell? I, I can't know, remember dude, every single day. I know I came here to like tell you everything, but I can't, bro. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> shame, shame, shame. I'm just gonna open this real. Uh, yeah, please brother. enjoy it. Um, hell yeah. So yeah, when does things start to get more serious for you? At some point, it leaves. Yeah, bedroom basement. Where are you starting to get real? 
Um, I'd probably say like, even when I started like playing in the instruments, like I said, um, just being inspired by those two artists and those two bands, um, it made me want to be in a band. Mm-hmm. Like, not made me want, like inspi- inspired me to be in a band. And my, obviously my brother playing, like he would just like, be in his room like mimicking songs on his guitar and then I would just kind of join in with him and then like that just kind of gave gave me the inspiration to like keep doing it and just Mm -hmm. like keep playing and just over time like I would like ask my friends like oh hey like you know like you should start playing guitar or like you should start playing drums you want you should get a drum set you should get a bass like Mm -hmm. let's get a PA system and then like just over time like just meeting friends and like going to school with friends it was like pulling teeth just to try to like start a band and just like I had the ideas there and then like the my the friends I would hang out with would like be inspired by the ideas and like kind of join in with me but like never would want to like keep going with it kind of yeah. sort of thing so yeah. like and then when I did start probably around like sixth grade um it was it was kind of like all over the place because like at the time I was listening to like Corn, Limp Bizkit, Blink-182, green day so like the spectrum of music was just like very wide yeah like huge 180 everything and like i wasn't listening to rap because like i was just like over rap at that point mm-hmm. um so it was just pretty much anything that was just like heavy hard fast kind of sort of whatever and just like good melody to it so and that's what kind of like like bled into like the first band that I was in because like we were playing all of these genres we were writing like met like new metal songs. We were writing like pop punk songs. We were writing ska songs. So like we were just like all over the place as kids, like in middle school, just like, oh, we should just play whatever we like. Yeah, it was cool to play whatever we wanted, but like we were just playing out of our garage, out of their garages and stuff like that. So like and not really getting any exposure. But like the only again, the only exposure we have is just like friends for friends and so we were playing different friends garages like <laughs> over the place and stuff like that you know so like but it was kind of cool because then once we started doing that like we were like going to shows and stuff like that at, like our local vfw mm-hmm. um norton massachusetts a lot of bands played there um like a lot of pop punk bands uh the early november came there one time i think the starting line was there or i'm not sure but there were it was like all those like kind of like pop punk emo bands kind of mm-hmm. like out of there and then like some metal bands were there and like a lot of like bands around there did like influence us to like play all those different kinds of music as well so like that's like why we did that in the sense and it was just like we didn't think about it how all over the place it was <laughs> and yeah. then so like through time like like i was in and out of that band and then i was going to more shows and I think the first like real real band I started was probably like I was in the eighth grade and it was uh out of Fall River Mass I went to a show and I saw uh like a couple like local like metal bands that like Mm -hmm. I was like friends with and stuff like that and I met a couple kids there and they were like like interested in one of the bands that was playing and then i started talking to them I'm like oh hey do you guys play instruments and then like they said yes whatever talking back and forth information and then eventually we started a heart like it was like a metal band um called 40 second love story okay so <laughs> it's yeah it's everyone can think whatever you want of that meme right now so you can meme the shit out of that <laughs> um so yeah we called it 40 second love story and it was just kind of like screamo kind of like metal stuff like kind of like fat i don't know if you know the term fashion core but like loosely loosely it rings about yeah so like think like norma jean yep uh the chariot yeah, yeah, yeah um i don't know some like older bands like maybe i want to say job for a cow i was gonna say job for a cowboy but i'd get punched in the face for that <laughs> um so like those kind of bands that were just like were just like very like I don't know, like metal and just like straight like screamo metal, mm-hmm. I guess. So we were kind of like playing that kind of music for a while. And then I started like listening to hardcore, like from a, a few friends that I was going to shows with. They brought me to like hardcore shows. And my first hardcore show actually was it was Bane, Terror, and Most Precious Blood. That's a huge lineup. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, aged really it was well. at the I think it was at the Met. 
yeah. Huge. yeah 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 so i think it was at the met and that was fucking intense like my first hardcore show like i i couldn't believe the amount of energy that was happening there it was just like crazy as fuck yeah and then that obviously inspired me to like write different kind of music as opposed to like writing like more metal music and then all my friends were like hey you guys should just be a hardcore band and then like eventually we we're like okay so we just eventually just kind of like it was like night and day where we just like switched over and then we just started getting more shows mm -hmm. because of the style and just like the era it was in like early 2000s like to like almost like late 2000s we were like pretty pretty well known like around like um like the boston area if mm -hmm. you will and like i think the furthest they went um this like Ohio or something like that, but that was just like one show. That was like a one off. Yep. But um, yeah, that was like pretty intense. Like just being in that hardcore band and just being in the scene, but like the hardcore scene and like being 15, 16 years old. Yeah. It's just like a whole different fucking world. Yeah. We uh we covered a lot of ground there. I had two notes I wrote down. Uh, one of them or three things I guess. One of them is that like you described being uh, how hard it was to, like get everyone together when you were in middle school, and I was laughing. Mm. It's like we're still grown adults, and it's even harder now to get everyone together. And we so all have cars. Now, we all have like free time. It's like yeah. imagine doing that before you had to beg for a ride from everyone. And it's like yeah. damn, like it, yeah, incredible that it ever happened and it worked out at all. Um, you mentioned the multi-genre like approach to the band. Now your first band had like ska songs and metal songs and all kinds of stuff going on in there. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really interesting approach because I think that normally someone's first band is like, I want to be architects. I want to be blah, blah, blah. I want to be good Charlotte. Mm. Like you, you yeah. have a, a North star and everything you do is trying to be that. And I think it's really admirable for you guys in hindsight. It's like, it's a, a flattering thing to look back on is like, that wasn't exactly how your brain worked. Your brain said, there's 10 things we like. How do we blend these things together? Which I think is yeah. a much more successful approach, but it's a much like much less success up front, right? I think when we're like a cover band, maybe is the perfect counterpart to that or the opposite of that. Or in a cover band, there's all the success up front because like the you're dealing with nostalgia, right? When you get up on stage and you play whatever journey song, like people already love it and you haven't really done a ton of work. Mm. But when you're trying to blend these 10 genres, like you're going to go through a lot of shit before you get anything that is a good product, but that good mm -hmm. product will have so much more value in it than this journey thing in the long run. Right. Not that right, yeah. obviously I have, who am I to talk poorly about journey? It's not no, necessarily no, what I'm no. saying here, but like, dude, Hey, you're uh, on your own journey right now, dude, with all of this. So, dude, good for you, man. Uh, fair enough. But you know what I'm saying? That like, yeah, yeah there, it seems like the, the harder way to do it, it's like eating all your vegetables. It's like, it's so much easier to just yeah. eat ice cream, but it seems mm. like you guys were, had a very healthy and like noble approach of like, no, how do we make all these things we love into one thing? Which I think, yeah, is a great trait to have in a person. Yeah. It's honestly like the way you said that it's like not eating your vegetables. Like I didn't eat my vegetables as I was a kid, but like as, as far as like a weird analogy, but like as far as music goes, like I have, since I started, like I've all put my whole time and effort into music mm -hmm. and like it, it shows you can ask anybody, like yeah. if anything comes up with music, I mean, obviously being older now, but like being younger, like, music was like my first priority yeah and like i didn't like want a job i didn't like really like going to school or whatever mm -hmm. and like you know there was a lot of people that had to push me in like the right direction to like grow out of it kind of mm -hmm. and i have and like now i know like the priorities that you need to have in order to be a full-time band and like a full-time musician and like unfortunately like people can't really i guess express themselves because it's in the end it call comes down to like finances yeah. and like you need to have the the right capital and everything else like that to yeah. like be a successful entrepreneur if you will absolutely yeah yeah and i think the other piece of that uh, i think the money part is interesting and it's been yeah something i've been trying to think about uh, mm -hmm. i've also been interested and i'd like to come back to that i guess is why i'm mentioning that but i'm also oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as you the other piece that you're describing is like that you know you kind of this, I think what you're saying you alluded to is like you run into this thing where you can be good at your art or you can be a happy and healthy person. And yeah. at some point, these two things, it's like, yeah, I could keep spending money on whatever band things like putting money into whatever the next investment thing is. But it's like at a certain point, the money has to go into a retirement fund. Like at a certain yeah. point, we got to think about the Roth IRA. And it's, <laughs> you need it's, a 401k, dude. <laughs> and it's not T-shirts that you can print and resell. It's like it help grow yeah. our brand. But it's like, yes, yeah. these two things have to be balanced. Yeah, I think I the, the flip side to me there is like the the Last Dance Michael Jordan documentary I've mentioned a couple times on here. Oh, shit. It's okay. just like a 
I think Michael Jordan doesn't seem happy in it. And that was the biggest takeaway for me. It's like he's done all this crazy shit. Like he has every honor you could ever want as a human. Like in some sense, he is as great as a person could be. But there's not a part of me that makes me think that I want to be him today on a Wednesday afternoon. Just like yeah. go hang out by the pool with him. Right. Like it seems like there is a something about him that it's unfulfilled still. And I don't think like one, what the hell do I know? Right. Maybe you would be no, like, no, no, but, right, but, like, but I think in the context, yeah. it's like it, it, there is something to be said of like you can be great at your thing, but there is a cost to it. And in the band thing, it's like. We can do it. We can keep dumping in, but there's going to be a point where we didn't put money in the Roth IRA, right? and it's going to go back and bite us. And exactly. Yeah, there yeah, is yeah. some balance here, and I think he's seeing it in him and Michael Jordan as like the peak of this. Made me look at myself and go, "Oh, this is true. Like this is true all the way to the top. There is always this this conflict of like, how great do you want to be, and what's that worth? What are you willing to pay for that thing? Right. Um, exactly. And yeah, it's worth being mindful of. Yeah, and it's like now, like you saying that, like. Even just like even just talking about the documentary and just like how you saw him and how he kind of like perceives himself now, it kind of like for anything like I feel like if you kind of make something more of a chore that you enjoy it first, it just becomes numb to you and mm -hmm. you just kind of like are just robotic to it. And it's just like that's like when you need to like step back and be like, well, I need to do something else now. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's why he wanted to play baseball because he's just like, I'm over this shit. You yeah. know, I need something new. But yeah. like, obviously. You know, sometimes the grass isn't greener on the other side. You mm -hmm. have to kind of, you know, yeah. dance with the devil, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's tough. And I think I've tried to be more mindful of that as I go of like, there isn't going to be an aha moment where this all is worth it. Right. It's always going to be this uh, this endless sense of like, oh, there's 10 percent more I could have done. And it's always yeah. going to be that and forever. It will be that. And like mm -hmm. the the sooner I can accept that, the sooner I can be happy in the 90 percent that I have recognized that I can do or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it seems like a, something that's worth being aware of. And I guess I've also been aware of it in the context of like writing a music video and for you guys to be writing songs of like I can try and write a great music video idea or I can have fun writing a music video idea. Mm -hmm. And those two things are not the same afternoon at all. And I think the fun one is probably the better product when it's all said and done. And I'm assuming mm -hmm. songwriting, there's a similar challenge of like you sit down at your DAW and it's like, I can try and write the craziest rhythms. I can change time signatures, every measure. I could do mm -hmm. something that's impossible or I can just hang out with Maddie and just have fun. And probably the thing with Maddie is going to come out better than this idea of like, let's sit down and write the craziest chug pattern ever possible. Or whatever, right. Like <laughs> yeah. there's something yeah. to be said for just having fun and not trying so hard. Right. And now that you're saying that, like, um, my writing process, like as far as that goes over the years, it kind of just like developed just from like listening to other people mm -hmm. and like listen to other ideas. I will say that I have taken ideas from people, but like who hasn't of course it's yeah. all inspiration yeah. so like thinking it back now like yeah it's just like whatever because i was younger just trying to learn yeah but um over the years just like listening to everything and just like wanting to hear like what i want to hear like mm -hmm. i have inspirations uh now like like death core like fit for an autopsy um molotov solution um a little bit heavier body snatcher like those kinds of bands like i want to hear that kind of music i want to hear fast heavy brutal like evil kind of shit hmm. so like over the years of like playing metal i just kind of like would just sit in my room and just kind of just fiddle around i'll probably like play like you know metallica songs like this is probably this is going back to like when i first started wanting to like mm -hmm. write music i just like play metallica songs and just be inspired to just like just riff and just like even just like playing just like one note for like i don't know like 20 minutes like yep. it can just inspire you to like think of other things to play and then like over the years like I would just kind of keep doing that and then i would just like i bought this looper pedal the line six dl4 i would like kind of like mess with that and then like play one layer and then i would like play like other layers and stuff like that that's cool yeah and like the only thing that sucked about that was like playing on just like playing uh, distortion through it like it's very like chopped up and like you can't really mm -hmm. hear the notes so like i would have to like play everything clean so like if i was like playing like a doodle like a doodle -doodle 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 -doodle. Mm -hmm. like on distortion it sounds sick but like if you play that with another yeah. line on you know yeah, it's, yeah, it just yeah, yeah. sounds all muddled and shit so, i can only relate because when i'm learning guitar i have a small like one by one practice amp and it has a button that says overdrive and yeah. so i can either press the button and it goes this crazy muddy sound <laughs> or i cannot press it it's a perfectly clean sound and i was always stuck because like sometimes i want this sometimes it, i usually want something in the middle and it's kind of the same thing what you're saying it's like yeah, you, you want to hear something nice but like if it yeah. just sounds like garbage just like yeah. sorry bro I, <laughs> Can't yeah. listen to that anymore <laughs> yeah and then like 
I would just like start listening to YouTube videos, mm -hmm. and then I would play along to like you know like um, like solo drum like audio and stuff like that, and like just get more inspiration from that, and just like again just just wanting to hear like what I want to hear, like yep. playing what I want to hear, kind of sort of thing, and then. Which I, I like this because that goes back to you at starting your first band with the, all the different influences. Like that's still your your character. And I think that's for me, right? I think the rap was playing before. And I think to me, like that's <laughs> yeah, that's part of the fun for me is like I like that yeah. I have all these things, and it's like I won't call those good songs, but they are fun to listen to. And somehow I think that is some part of the the recipe that makes my creativity. And it's been fun to kind of be like. Yeah, I don't have to only take inspiration from metalcore music videos, right? Like, this right, can come exactly, from anywhere. Yeah. It can come from bad mm -hmm. SoundCloud rap. And that's a fun place to find it for me. And that's, yeah. that's part of it. And I can totally attest to listening to different kinds of music because I don't just listen to metal, obviously. Like, I've always told myself, like, oh, I'm just going to listen to metal my whole life and I'm not going to listen to anything else. But, yeah. like, my mind is, like, way too, like, biased to, like, only, like, one genre. Mm -hmm. So, like... I like pop punk, you know, I like classic rock and like, I think listening to other kinds of music or like, even in your case, like just like watching other photographers or like mm -hmm. watching other photo like videos and stuff like that. It's just like, it opens up your mind to like actually doing the thing or like the topic that you want to do kind of sort of thing. One of my favorite, uh, I agree with you. And to your point, one of my favorite little, like, I don't know, activities, hobbies, whatever is like on Reddit. I follow all the, the after effects editing and the music video editing things and mm -hmm. the 3d, whatever, all the different subreddits. Um, I shouldn't say all of them. That's gonna be crazy. <laughs> activity, whatever, a bunch of them. Uh, and people often post like, Hey, I'm having this issue. How would I fix it? Or, Hey, I want to build this. How would I do it? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not very active in it, but it's a really good mental exercise for me to see the question and go, how would I solve that? And I'm not animating a Lilo and Stitch style cartoon, but like if I was, yeah. how would I solve this problem that they're running into? Uh, and it's a really similar kind of to your point of the different genres for me from the, the video perspective. It's like, yeah, I'm not animating, but there is something in this world that's valuable to me. And what is that pearl? And by kind of engaging with this question that's not asked to me and has nothing to do with what I'm doing, but it's a quick like, 30 second mental puzzle of like, how would I try and solve that? And it's a mm, way yeah. to kind of force your brain to look at stuff differently. And I think ultimately, yeah, it all, all pays off in the end somehow. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Um, hell yeah, dude. Uh, Going back to first band stuff. I know, yeah. Holy <laughs> shit, dude. We'll talk Tangents, about fucking drifting. Tangents are the best part of this. Yeah, we yeah. got all the time in the world. And then, yeah, I'll keep this a little through line for when I run out of other interesting <laughs> hell, things hell to yeah, say. Dude. Um, I could have kept going. I could have <laughs> just kept going down a rabbit hole. I'm like, all right, dude. <laughs> Always, dude. Rabbit holes are my favorite place to exist. Hell yeah. Um, the bands are getting really mentioned that there's a, a band somewhere in like early high schoolish where it starts to become more of a. You said there was like a couple bands you were in and out of, and then finally something takes hold. Like, what is that first thing that kind of takes hold? Um, that was uh, going back, it was 40, 40 second love story. Right. Okay. Um, kind of originated in eighth grade and uh, like eighth to ninth grade. And I was also in another band at the time it was called Arson Cry, which is like a, another, it was like a screamo band. You know, again, whole, whole, totally 180 of like yeah. spectrums and stuff like that. So like I was doing vocals in that band and that was more like inspired by like Under Oath and again, Norma Jean um, and like with like keyboards and stuff like that and all that other kind of sort of thing. Um, and then obviously the hardcore stuff where I was just playing guitar in and that kind of like clashed over time because like, again, the whole like, which one do I want to kind of like spend my time yeah. more in? And it obviously ended up being the hardcore because it had more traction and more of a crowd and stuff like that. So were you like the uh, quarterback in these bands? Like I, my understanding now is that you're very involved in the bands you're in. You're very involved in the writing process and the planning process. Like, I feel like you are, I feel like in every band there's guys who are of all different levels of involvement. Right, no, <laughs> and exactly, I feel like you've yeah. always, uh, <laughs> my understanding is that you've always been in the quarterback and kind of in the driver's seat or as close to it as possible or whatever, co-piloting with someone. Mm -hmm. uh, is that similar to how these are in the eighth grade projects? Are you, I think I, you said earlier that like you went out and found people and you're always trying to find people. Like it sounds like mm -hmm. you've always kind of been the driving force in a lot of these projects. Is that kind of how it was back then where you're doing a lot of the writing, you're trying to find all the shows, like you're the one doing a lot of the hustling for this? Yeah, so as far as like the writing goes, like that's pretty much all I like was really like driving myself to do is just like write like good music and like write obviously music that I wanted to hear mm -hmm. and again just finding the people was like pulling teeth and trying to find yep. a needle in a haystack yeah because like not a lot of kids back then like wanted to like play instruments they wanted to play sports you know and play football yep. kind of sort of whatever and like 
again, that was just like how it was over time, even like when I was like playing like in like full time bands, like mm -hmm. again, 40 second love story was well, 40 SLS. Um, like I was still trying to like write other music and like play in other bands because like that's I was a kid and that's like all I wanted to do. Yep. And like everybody had their sports in high school and like it was probably like the first two years of high school where I was like really like doing 40 SLS and like everything was like going good. The traction was good. We were playing. We were practically playing like around all Massachusetts and stuff. We were like a Massachusetts local band, hardcore band and um, played like some Rhode Island days, but whatever. Uh, and just over time with that, that was just like, again, um, what else can I play? Like, what else, like, what else can I write? What else can I do? And yeah. like, I was playing in like another hardcore band that I was again, like you saying, like the quarterback of just trying to like write good music. And like, that was more mm -hmm. like kind of like a, like a melodic hardcore as opposed to like the tough guy hardcore I was playing. So like, again, just like how much can I write? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I don't know what else to say. It's just like, I wanted to write music all the time. That's a really interesting thread to, I think a lot of people have talked to in your chair of this idea of like, uh, it's never enough. It's this idea of always pursuing more and taking on more and trying to challenge more and find the new way to pursue the thing. And it's an interesting, like uh, I've talked about on here before, but like the challenge, like we're not a, a society, a musical group that is identified as like being good students. We're not defined as being great in, yeah. in academics normally, but there is this like lifelong determination of learning that I think is really interesting. Like, I don't know. I don't quite know how to rationalize it. Like, how do you, it's something that we all are very good at. I don't know how to quantify. It. I don't know what the trait is, but it's something that I've heard a lot of people describe of like, it was kind of working and I still wanted more and then it worked well. And I, kept wanting more like it there's never a point of what's the word I'm looking for cessation that's not the word sustainability um, sure oh. sustainability. <laughs> oh no no like consistency um I mean yeah I I know what I know what you're saying and it's just like again when I was just playing in the bands like I was listening to other music and I was just like inspired to play that kind of music from that kind of artist mm -hmm. so again like I wasn't really like there was actually like probably like maybe one band I was trying to like do like a pop punk band with someone, mm -hmm. but like obviously that just fell through. But like again, when I talk about it with someone and they're like, "Oh, I want to do this," I'll literally go home and like start writing songs like that, mm -hmm. like pop punk. Like I'll be like, I told them like, "All right, we'll just be like one of those bands that just has a weird weird ass tuning." I was like, "We'll just be open E." He's like, "I don't know what that is, but <laughs> do it." I was like, "Okay, cool." cool. Yeah. So like, think about a pop punk band playing an open E, like. And just like, I don't know, just like no one does figure that it shit. Out. Yeah, yeah, just like figure kind of the, shit theirs, out. But yeah. like, yeah, just like over the years, just like weird, weird ideas and just like weird inspirations just came, came to me or come, still come to me. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, when is this channel? So we're in bands. Um, uh, actually, going back there, one other thing I want to touch on is you mentioned that you're going through high school and you're realizing that you're more into the metal stuff than the, yeah, whatever else you're exploring. The metal stuff really comes home that the the evil, the violence of it, the intensity of it really attracts you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been fascinated of like, I don't think the, the stereotype is that people who like this thing are angry and violent and all that. It's like, I've never believed that to be true, but I don't quite know. Or I'm curious on your take of like, how do you justify being a good human, but also love listening and consuming things where <laughs> people are getting slaughtered and murdered and it's, it's the most horrific shit. And there's a, <laughs> a yeah. almost a goal of writing the most horrific shit. But, it's yeah, like, brother. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure that there is a dickhead somewhere in there who means it, but by no, yeah. and large, like I don't think fit for an autopsy wants to kill anyone. Like, no, I, I, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, like, those guys are probably the nicest guys I've ever met. And yeah. just, like, so, like, it's definitely a stereotype, mm -hmm. and it still is a stereotype. So, like, growing up listening to metal, like, I was a nice, like, I'm obviously I'm still a nice person, but <laughs> other people can think whatever. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, so, like, yeah, it's just, like, again, stereotype that, like, there are nice people who listen to metal. Like, I don't know. It's just, like, but there are dickheads that listen to metal too sure. like you were just saying so like i don't know it's just like it's a weird it's just like a weird like thing now it's just kind of like where's like the medium and where's like the happy place of like like a nice person or like listening to metal kind of mm -hmm. sort of thing so like yeah i don't know like i personally kind of just went backwards with it instead of just like listening to metal first because like i never knew who to listen to like when i started listening to music because it all just came again from my parents so like i and then i inspired by listening to the radio and then listening to rap and then kind of just like 
obviously rap has its you know evil stuff in it but like mm -hmm. especially rough riders like i uh, but i thought that shit was cool like watching that shit on tv and just yeah. like let, driving the driving the atvs uh, through the city i was oh, just yeah. like i want to do that stuff yep. so i was just like that's a rough ride mm -hmm. like <laughs> in the living room my mom's like all right whatever he likes i guess and then i guess that heaviness developed into more heaviness mm -hmm. so like i don't know just like my whole life i just like wanted to just listen to heavy music i guess in a sense just like stuff that just hits hard yep and like again like that being stigmatized as like oh like i wonder if he's a dickhead because he listens to metal and it's just like no i mean it's just like the kind of music i like you know <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it's always fascinated me because it's like it doesn't i don't believe the two are connected but i can't logically argue how they're not connected like there's no way to be that yeah, someone who like <laughs> enjoys writing about decapitating someone isn't somehow off base somehow but it's like i've met plenty of those people who are perfectly functional yeah and i don't know what's going on in their brain in their room when they're writing in their journal about this <laughs> but like everything else seems to add up and come up come up gold to me so yeah george uh, corpse grinder shops at target and he picks up the big old like uh stuffed animals or whatever like <laughs> Like, I don't know how much, like, more simple and, like, yep. wholesome you can get. Like, yep. I think he's also and, doing, like, the Christmas drive. He's always got, like, donations going on. Like, oh, he's dude. always got stuff going on. Yeah. No, yeah. He's, like, yeah, again, just the whole stereotype of, like, cannibal corpse. Like, oh, they're probably going to go and kill you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of sort of thing. But yep. it's like, no, they're the nicest dudes ever. Yep. So. <laughs> was that, like, a black sheep for you in high school thing? Or was it, like, a... Uh, like it was an issue for you or were you just kind of happy at liking what you liked and there was enough people around you who also liked it that it wasn't a thing um i was in the very small percentage of in my class throughout all the years of school that listened to metal and only metal at the time obviously mm -hmm. where my mind was like i'm only going to listen to metal so like the like when i kind of when i started listening to new metal got my goth phase got the parachute pants oh dude the, the big old Huge. fucking the big old uh, metal balls. You've described so many things I need to see on VHS tapes from the past. <laughs> Bro, yeah, and then I would wear, like, oversized, like, Slipknot tool, um, and then I'd try to have, like, uh, the spiked hair. I know you, I know you don't, don't believe it now, but <laughs> I'm bald as fuck. Um, but I used to have hair, and I would spike it up and get, like, colored tips and shit, and then, like, yeah, I would be all over the place, That's too. That's the coolest shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> no, like, I would, like, I would try to be, like, what i saw in the magazines mm -hmm. i would try to be that like yep. it's just like i want that image like if i was gonna go big i was gonna go big <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like yeah i don't know i just like and that developed and then so like just being in that kind of like just everyone knew me as like just like someone who listened to metal and all mm -hmm. that other stuff like that so like being in my class like and like over the years of my clothing change in my music metal music <laughs> genre change yeah my rebranding over the years i was i was a goth kid i was like i was i was rap i was like so i went from goth to new metal and then obviously the hardcore tough guy i was wearing like south pole like um you know like rockefeller <laughs> Pretty much all that stuff. I was wearing like baggy North Face puffy vests. Um, I had Fila's. Um, yeah, I was just all over the Huge, place during yeah. that. Yeah, I, I was. I'm trying to think of other stuff, but like Big that's w. pretty much like I think you guys got it. I had the chin strap beard. <laughs> like it was terrible. Just, just and then like shit everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna tell you my whole outfit. And then I had um, I had these diamond five eighth plugs, like you know the fake ones that you see at Hot Topic that look like diamonds. Like yeah, I, and then I had the grills too. Like oh my god, that was so fucking terrible. Like you know the fake ones you get at the fucking um, what's it called? Like the stands in the mall. And like yeah, you can yeah. take it home and just boil it and just fucking put them in. And be like yeah, dog. Like yeah. So um, yeah, I did that. And then I kind of just got normal after that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Like, I was like in and out of a phase. Actually, no, I didn't really get normal because, like, in high school, I like I started becoming like a prep. Like when I was like playing sports, we'll probably get to that moment soon. And then, like, I was wearing like Abercrombie, fucking, uh, you know, Hollister, all that other shit. And like the thing that sucked was I was such I was a big kid, so like all like the XL stuff run small so like i would wear the shirts once and i wouldn't wear them ever again because they would just shrink after that so and then Jesus. after that then after that i was normal 
everything was normal after that. I was just like a normal ass dude. I'm like, I don't have to wear this shit anymore. I don't think anyone could go through all of that and come out normal. I think that's <laughs> inherently a basis for not being normal in the rest of your life. Well, I hold on. My my uh, my partake of normal is not what your normal is. Okay, so I feel normal now. <laughs> I uh, feel like I just dress like a normal dude. I'm sure. just like, yeah, sure, closer, <laughs> yeah. closer than who? It's all about degrees. All about <laughs> yeah. Now you know my whole fucking history of clothing. Perfect, perfect. Uh, at some point, we grow out of being a fashion model. Yeah, and at some point, in depth of times comes along into our lives. Uh, when does that th- thing go in? Okay. That, then, at least in my my outside perspective, it feels like in depths and tides is kind of where this thing becomes like a grown up thing, where you've kind of gone through high school bands, and this feels like I don't know if it starts at the end of high school, but it seems like mm-hmm. the the first kind of step into adult band life of like really making a I don't know an adult effort in this thing of being past like the high school like let's see let's see and now yeah, it's yeah. like all right exactly. let's fucking figure this out we got five guys who all align with me they've all also done this through high school and been kicked out of bands and done all the other dumb shit band guys do mm-hmm. like let's give us an honest effort and figure it out like when does yeah when does in depth and tides kind of start forming all right so like to kind of like go back a little bit into another rabbit hole sure um so there was like a long long time before in depths and tides it was probably Oh God, it was maybe, no, actually it wasn't a long time. So there was, it was probably maybe about three or four years okay. until like, I was like really like playing with that, like playing in like bands again and stuff. Cause I was like in and out of playing and like one off bands and like playing on one off shows and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, uh, probably around 20, 2012 in depths and tides really kind of started taking off and like joining the band like i was really kind of like seen as like like being older like mm-hmm. kind of seen as like the, not the father figure but like he's like more experienced more like seasoned veteran of like being in bands and stuff like that and to be quite honest like i really didn't know a lot of like what being in the band was like because yeah. i never really dealt with like finances or like merch or like trying to get that stuff um, there was one time where I made CDs for us. I got CDs made, so I'm going to pat myself on the back <laughs> still for that. Hell yeah. Um, oh, and I got a tour together for a weekend, so I'll pat myself on the back. Big, big, that. big. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's obviously later. But uh, so like starting out, like um, I was dealing with like most of like the ticket sales for like uh, like playing out and stuff like that and like really dealing with that kind of finance end. But like, we only really didn't really start doing that until like we started like going to shows in Providence and Mm -hmm. like just trying to like connect that way. And then like, obviously word of mouth from like the, um, like the members that were in the depths and tides, they were in like bands before and stuff like that. So like they had friends that like word of mouth and going to shows, vice Mm -hmm. versa, everything else like that. So like once that really started taking off, um, it was like, at, at the time in depths and tides kind of is what euclid is now in the sense that it was like the quarterbacks from other bands coming together is that a kind of a fair yeah so maddie and i are considered the quarterbacks yeah of in depths and tides um i never well kind of going back again i kind of just joined them just to like do like a whole nother kind of like genre um like a genre flip well not like a genre flip but like a mm-hmm. i was still playing i was playing metal i was playing like deathcore in one band called prisoner um, and in depths and tides was happening at the same time. So I was just like, Oh, I want to play like more melodic stuff, like more mm-hmm. leady stuff because I was just the only guitarist in prisoner. Gotcha. And I was just like, Oh, I want to like play more like not happier stuff, but like more like songs with like melody and stuff. <laughs> happier. So, yeah, funny yeah, words fuck, I, yeah, it's just like, yeah, <laughs> I know what like, you mean musically, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. So if you're thinking, ha- if I say happy, think of it as more like an evil thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So happy, Bend evil. And happy, like music <laughs> yeah, are the funniest yeah. things to wear together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, I was just like, I was jamming with them and then prisoner kind of just like was just falling off or whatever. Um, just like the members and stuff, just like not being Band into life. it. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And then, uh, so doing in depths and tides, Maddie, uh, that's like when I met Maddie, kind of like, well, like started working with Maddie. I met him a while before that. Like he did photos for, um, that's funny. Cord. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, first time I met Maddie was, uh, South Attleboro American Legion. Uh, I was in a band called Chords and he was doing photography that night and then he wanted to do promos for us. I didn't then, know that. It's funny. Yeah, That's cool. He was, I was 18 and he was 16, I believe. 
So like he had to have his dad drop him off where we were getting promos hell yeah <laughs> and we were all just like it was, it was obviously something i would do too if like if i was like a photographer mm-hmm. and like trying to do like promo stuff or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah so like it was cool like that was the first time meeting him and then like over the years like before in depths and tides like we would be jamming and stuff like that we would write music together we would just hang out and stuff so like even before we got serious together musically like we were always just like hanging out like writing or mm-hmm. like playing instruments or whatever like doing dude stuff whatever <laughs> yeah <laughs> but like um so when in depths and tides like started going like him and i were just kind of like we we kind of clicked like very fast mm-hmm. and everything kind of just started molding together because he kind of has a good he has a good rhythmic style and i have a good more like lead style so like that kind of coming to coming together mm-hmm. um even if we played like different things it still like came out really good Cool. And okay. So like that's the kind of approach I had like musically within Depths and Tides at first, like playing kind of like not so much like polyrhythmic stuff, but like more just like syncopated guitars and like very rhythmic drums and bass and stuff like that. Are you uh, at the time you're writing this, you're yeah, 16, you're 18, you're younger than you are now. Uh, I think hold on, sorry, I, you I met was me like at 16 or 18. I think I might be. No, so 16. So I think Maddie would probably be 18, and I think I'm like 20, 21. Okay. Yeah. So like a, a couple of years. Yeah. You're so in prime like, ego time, I guess was my point yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And so as you're writing this, these polyrhythmic things, are you trying to write the hardest song possible, or are you already kind of aware that it's about having fun with Maddie and writing a good song? Like it sounds like you're describing that you're writing the polyrhythmic stuff like you're you were trying to write things with as many buzzwords as possible that was as complicated as possible for the sake of having a complicated thing right uh, is that where you were or were you already kind of mature enough to know like no it's about having fun it's not about having the most complicated tab here um so i'd probably have to say that like we i never i so my whole music knowledge is like very very slim mm-hmm. and like my vocabulary is very slim but like I'm starting to like get more like familiar with like like obviously notes like per minute and like beats mm-hmm. and stuff like that and just like reading that kind of like music but like at the time like I never really I never really had like a perception of what polyrhythms were. I just thought it was just like a bunch of junk and then like Gotcha. <laughs> excuse me. And which it is to be fair for the record. <laughs> yeah, it can honestly like it still kind of sounds like junk to me, but like I can still like hear the rhythm and I'm still like going with it. But yeah. like it's just sounds like polyrhythm stuff can be sick. So like hearing that stuff back then, like eye on distance kind of shit, I was just like, what the fuck is going on? So like I would try to like, I guess like not mimic that, but like I would just try to make that more on like a rhythm based level as opposed to like more, more audible, mm-hmm. like easy, like audibly easier to hear. So like, that's what I kind of like approached like as far as like writing breakdowns and like doing rhythm stuff. But Maddie has been more of like the breakdown guy and like the rhythm guy. So like whenever that like whenever breakdowns come, like even now, like I'll just have him write breakdowns. Interesting. Okay. And I'll just I'll be more of like the shreddy guy. Cool. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, cool. In depth and tides happens. Um I guess my one other question there is like, what kind of stands out for the Depth and Tides journey? Obviously, there was a lot of years in that band, a lot of yeah, a lot of places traveled, a lot of shows played. Like, Shit, yeah. uh, what stands out as like a the memorable, like a lesson you took away from it? Like, if, after all that, now that all the dust is settled, now that it kind of is is what it is, uh, what stands out? Something that you took away from it, something you learned, something that you yeah gained as an experience along the way. Um, what's stuck with you? Um, well, there's there's honestly there's a lot of things that. I that we that we did as a band financially that we shouldn't have done um, uh, from, management lyric videos what are we talking uh like just like as far as like investing into shows because like being a band and just starting out it's really hard to like get you know get like the crowd that you mm-hmm. need and stuff like that yep. like especially like if um a venue wants to sell 30 tickets and you only sold 10 and they need you to get the rest, you know, kind of sort of thing. But like, even like, like, again, just starting out, just like being a local band at first is like, it's pretty fucking hard. And it's like, you need to like invest a lot of time and money Mm -hmm. before you really start to play shows. And like, we didn't really do that. We kind of just like use all of out of our pocket money Mm -hmm. to like play these shows, but only just because we wanted to be heard and we wanted people to know who we were. 
what would have been a better way to spend that money or would have been the or would the answer have been to not spend that money and save it for a year later when you can invest it in a place that's more beneficial like what would in hindsight what would have been the better way to spend the money or to approach that problem of yeah growing a band um honestly it would probably just to be to do your research yeah and like really but like back then like being as young as naive and just like stubborn as we were of like course. we just wanted to fucking play of and course. we just wanted to like play the shows and stuff and like we didn't really think about like like i guess the real job role of being in a band okay until probably like maybe probably like the middle years we were like playing like that's like when we were like pretty solid like we uh we, that's like when we came out with bioluminescence like mm -hmm. that's when we like started like really being a band and like really like getting everything together like financially but like we were kind of giving it all to our vocalists at the time so like at the in the end like it wasn't really a group effort and like that's what it needs to be course, so like yeah, yeah. each member of the band needs to like have its own role have their own role yeah and like have like that responsibility just to keep everything like you know Cohesive. together yeah, yeah. and it's just like we didn't really do that and obviously now being euclid like it's more of just like a business now mm -hmm. and it's just like yeah we need to do it this way or else like it's just gonna fall and crumble so I've, i think i heard maddie describe it similarly that you guys came into this very aware that everyone's gonna have their own job in the band yeah. have you guys stuck with that framework has euclid still been successful in divvying up the work into the five people oh absolutely yeah i mean there's always communication i mean i know there's distance between all five of us i mean well maddie and i not so much like mm -hmm. we kind of we just live like right down the street from each other but like as far as kevin coco and Zach, Zach being the furthest, like he's almost in Canada. So like communication is always like a key thing to have and like yep. just making sure everything is set on the board and everyone is on board, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keeping everyone together. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. are you guys like in discord together in weekly calls? Like how are you supporting this goal for communication? Um, we just have iMessage. Yeah, I mean, we're like, we're all pretty much just texting each other day by day and like, I'm not really looking at the messages that much just because I know that they're going to be there and I just kind of look back. But like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a problem of like, oh, hey, like, what did you guys say earlier? And then Maddie would be like, scroll up, dude. <laughs> just like, all right, my bad. Classic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stuff. yeah. It's like, dude, just scroll up. I'm like, I don't want to. Just tell me. <laughs> but uh, yeah. summarize it, dude. I don't want to read 10 messages when you <laughs> yeah. can send me one message, dude. Exactly. Yeah, Make yeah. my life easy. Dude. I thought we were in a band together. Help me out. And like, they'll, there'll be like 50 to like 70 messages. So I'm just like, the, 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 yeah. the, the, I'm just like, what the fuck? And then someone started talking about something else in the middle of it all. And it's like, bro, come on. <laughs> yeah. Hook it up here. I know. It yeah. goes back to that, back to those, like, message said and yep. it's just like what the fuck i have to keep scrolling but yep. yeah but uh, as far as that communication goes it's good um i don't know everything just seems to be kind of just flowing we're just kind of going with the flow um yeah i don't know just taking um, our time with it yeah uh, as we the, i guess a couple times it's come up along the way of just like that at this point we're starting to think about retirement and like having to be an adult and like be mm. yeah having to be more realistic about this thing and not be a naive 20 year old who's like i'm gonna make a million dollars next year so who the fuck cares about what's happening right now right oh, like, right yeah there's yeah. A, a part of us that has to go no at some point we're adults and this is going to be what it is and it might get better it might get worse but probably we're kind of about where we're going to be to some extent um my what was my little note there oh um i've been trying to get better at just like being present in the moment and appreciating it and i guess to me uh, I was going through records the other day and I realized that in my first year of camera stuff, so in 2016, mm -hmm. I shot a hundred shows my first year and I made about a thousand dollars total and I spent about five thousand oh, okay. dollars. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. I was shooting a show every three days and losing a couple hundred dollars a week. Mm -hmm. And like that's what year one was. And in hindsight to me, it's like looking back at that and being like, I haven't that hasn't that is not how my business is running right now to say right. the, like at the very least it's not how i'm running now right and yeah. quite simply it's like a lot of those people that i was working for free are now hiring me like i'm now making a living with this thing i was in maine this weekend working like i'm there's still plenty of room to grow like my car is on its last legs like these chairs we were just describing are falling apart like no, yeah. <laughs> there's still plenty of things in life that could grow and get better and like things aren't yeah, perfect man. but like i it has become a living it has become stable and it's like there's this weird I'm trying to be, I appreciate that and be present more and like a, just be proud of what I've built and also aware that like, yeah, I'm still not happy. I still feel like I'm, I have everything to grow and I still feel like I've done nothing, but it's like to say I've done nothing is unfair to myself. Like I have mm -hmm. done something and we can debate the size of that thing, but it's like, no, I 
I went from playing soccer to saying, I think music sounds cool. And now I'm here making a living along the way. Like that is something. And yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess the flip side there is like in Euclid, it's like you've gone through all these bands and yeah, obviously they ended. That's where, why we got to here. But like in the context of Euclid, it's like we're not in Australia right now, but there is this music video that did do really well. There is an EP that did really well. We have mm. played these shows that people have come out to. Like, there is something to be proud of here. And, yeah, it's not the pictures of the koala that we would all love to be posting right now. But, like, yeah, yeah. it's not nothing, right? And uh, I've been trying to get better at balancing these two things of, like, we're not Justin Bieber, but, like, we're a long way away from where we would have dreamt of being at 16, right? Mm. Like, I go back to myself at 16, and it's like, I would have killed to have this life in some capacity. And I don't know if I would have planned this exact life, but oh, like, yeah. it's easy to feel that way when you're younger and it's 100%. like, it's hard to like appreciate that kind of shit. hundred percent. Is that something you have? Are you successful in it? Like, is it, are you, do you have any success in appreciating that Euclid is doing something? Like, are you able to be present in the moment or is this always, or yeah. Are you still struggling with the, the sense of needing to do more and accomplish more? Um, I'm pretty, I'm actually going to say I'm pretty content and like oh, yeah. with every, everything musically right now. Um, Again, I'm always just, like, sitting and writing shit. Like, the other day, like, I wrote just, like, a little thing. Like, um, I watch, uh, I don't know if you know, Ola England. Okay. Yeah, he does, like, the Sundays with Ola and, like, the beginning track. Or, like, the beginning, beginning, like, minute is, like, him playing along to a drum track. And then he puts it in his Dropbox, like, the drum track. And anybody can play along to it and, like, post it. So, like, sometimes I'll just, like, obviously you just riff out to mm -hmm. it. So it's pretty cool. But, um it's kind of similar to the nail yeah. the mix thing I always hear guys doing where it's like, yeah, you're just getting stems and playing with it. And yeah, having yeah. A, a small project to work with. So like being like being in a band now and like doing the band stuff, like I, again, look back on everything that I've done. And then like there'll be moments where I'm just like, why am I doing this still? Yeah. Like, why am I still here? Like, why? Why am I continuing to do this? And like going back to like the Michael Jordan thing, like it's not there was a time where this was completely numb to me. Sure. And like, I didn't want, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. And like, there was just so many, so many things I like was writing and just like so many, like so many people I was talking to, to like write music yeah. with and like try to like, get together and just trying to like make something, just you know, that dreamer stage. Exactly. Yeah. Like making yeah. the, making the perfect band, the perfect songs, mm -hmm. fucking making a million mm -hmm. dollars every day. Yep. No. Yep. Um, but yeah, like I had that, I still had that thought, like even like my late teens and early 20s like i had i still had that dream of like being a touring international touring band and like making all this money off of i had it yeah. last week yeah i'm still like, no, in the no, middle of exactly yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like and like now i'm just like everything i have worked for all like obviously it all adds up to this now me feeling content yeah. with my music and like wanting to do these like i mean shows are just coming naturally now and just like i don't have to like really like do the do the chore of like looking mm -hmm. for shows just because of the success i have had with both the bands i'm in mm -hmm. so like it's really it's really humbling to like just live in that kind of moment and like doing tours and stuff like that it's it's just like i don't know, like and obviously being older and wanting yeah. to be younger to do that I think it's a lot better being older now because if I was younger doing that, I think I would have been in a very bad hole of like addiction and all that other shit, like yeah. of yeah. being in a band and, you know, like being on tour, yep. doing all the shit, you know what I'm saying? So like now being older and just like being more like aware of everything else and just like being the state I'm in and just like being sober and like, I don't know, it's just like, more clarity to like what I yeah. want to do and like more love and appreciation. Yeah. Now, so I think that's huge. And yeah, I agree with you that I, I recognize like uh, me and Justin Bieber about the same age. <laughs> and when I was in high school, like he Fuck was always, Bieber, dude. he was always getting into trouble. It was always this crazy thing to me. Piece like, no. yeah, like what are you doing? Like you have everything guy. Like yeah, why yeah. are you going a hundred miles an hour? Your Lambo through Miami. Like you're going to kill saying, someone. Dude. Like just yeah. don't do that. And now that I'm, yeah, an adult and I'm older, I can look back and be like, oh, that would have fucked me so bad. Like, thank God I haven't had that. And like, 
I have had my small success and right. not that I'm in a Lamborghini in Miami, but like, you know, you get recognized once in a while you're at the show and like, I'm sure you've been at a show that you weren't playing and someone came up to you and was like, Oh, are you the guy from, and it's but like, that's your Lamborghini dude. Like is. those people coming up to you and just like, you don't have to go up to them. Like that's saying, the best thing. Even those moments are intoxicating enough to make me act a fool. <laughs> no, like, God exactly. damn, dude, if I was a beaver with a real Lamborghini, <laughs> dude, I'd be fucked up. Like no, even yeah, those yeah. moments like weigh on me. And it's like, I almost have to like actively forget them of like, it's great that I've made this impact, but like, I can't live in that. Like, I, I need to appreciate. It. I need to move on from it. Like, they mm. both things have to be real. And yeah, to your point, it's like, thank God I didn't find that when I was twenty one because it would have been a fucking disaster. And yeah. yeah, I don't know what that disaster would have looked like. I don't know where it would have brought me, but like, for sure, it wouldn't have been healthy. No, I can exactly. say that much at the very least. That's like those are like that's like the only what if that yeah. I have. It's just like. What if, like, I was this? What if I, like... Sure. But, like, those are, like, the negative what ifs. Yeah. And it's just, like, I never want to be in a situation where it's just, like, a positive what if. Yeah. Like, but there was one time where I was working. See, this is a, this is a, this is a bad what if. Okay. So I was working full time at Hannaford. I was, like, maintenance or whatever, but... They call it maintenance, but you're a janitor because you cleaned everything. And they call it maintenance just to make you feel better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was doing that, and then, like, I was just kind of, like, whatever, just partying all the time, mm -hmm. just whatever, spending my money on whatever I wanted. And, like, there was a tour happening, um, What Lies Beneath the Tide. That's the band I was going to play guitar for, and they were touring with Vital Remains. Okay. It was a U.S. tour, and I was just, like, Oh, dude, I want to do it so bad. But I had to learn how to play the songs and shit. So, like, again, I went home. Mm -hmm. I fucking started to try to learn how to play everything, try to, like, use Power Tab and, like, all that other shit and try to listen. But, like, they were, like, one of those bands where they had the weird polyrhythms and stuff like that. And that's yeah. where I was kind of introduced to the whole polyrhythm era. But, um, and then, like, I was just, like, I said yes, and then I ended up saying no just because, like, I was just like, I don't know if I could do this financially and everything else like that. So I'm glad I didn't because I knew I wouldn't have survived. So, yep. <laughs> yeah, those times you look back where it's like, oh, thank God I didn't spend more time with that friend because yeah. that friend would not have <laughs> taken me to a good place. No, exactly. Yeah. yeah 100%. Yep. 100%, dude. Yeah. I've got the same thing. Um, hell yeah. We were just about past our hour here. Uh, there's one other last thing note that I had here that I think kind of fits in what we were talking about. Uh, and my, my general summary here, my little notes myself was just like tour versus home. And, uh, I think I've toured three weeks total, right? So like a week here, a weekend or here, you know, whatever, like a little bit. Yeah. Um, so not much, but enough that I felt like my best road to a happy future is by being home more. Like I, I don't quite believe that for me and the way that I'm wired, that tour is a way that would have made me happy. That would have been fulfilling and would have been sustainable long-term. Mm -hmm. And I want to be very careful. Like I, everyone's wired differently and I'm speaking very much for me and not about tours a whole. Well, no. Yeah. Cause every, again, sorry to interrupt, but like Please, yeah. everything, everything is all personally, it's all personal experience for each and every person that is yeah. on tour or yeah. does a kind of tour. If you yeah. Will. And I guess from, from where I'm sitting, it feels like tour, strips a lot of life out of people and i think it mm. opens up a lot of doors for a lot of fun and a lot of excitement but it seems like something that you can't do forever mm -hmm. and it's it, there's a there's a finiteness to that uh, i don't know whatever there's a terminal date to that absolutely and, and we were talking about the, you know the financial the retirement stuff and to me that's one part of it is like i don't think i can build a good future if i'm not here for the whole time and by being yeah. home it's like I can start to, yeah, the the financial side of stuff, start to think about investing in all that bullshit, but also like just spend more time with my family, just be a part of a community. And I think being on tour for me is like leaving home and then coming back to this place. It's like this place feels foreign and then you're longing for a place that literally doesn't exist, right? You're longing for a bus that was moving between places. Like it's not mm -hmm. sustainable. And so I think what I felt like, I think there was a point in my 20s where I was like, dude, I have to get on tour or I'm a failure. And I've found some <laughs> comfort in being like, no, I think I'm glad that I got enough tour experience to know what it was and also enough to go, nah, not quite for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious on your stance. Like I, I think your tour experience is similar where you haven't done six months in a row, but you've done yeah a month here, a couple weeks there, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it, does tour feel like something that you wish you will do more of or wish you had done more of? Does it feel like something that is kind of like how it feels to me where it doesn't feel like the perfect alignment for you? Um, yeah, so again, I'm going to go back and say, if I was touring as much as I was touring now back then, it definitely would lead me to a road, just like a just like a bad road. Yeah, it, it, would, it wouldn't lead me into a positive way. It would lead me into the negative way of yeah. of being in a band, um, because I had to like there was a lot of time like over the past 
I don't know, I'd probably say 2020. Um, like, anytime, like, uh, I would play shape thrower shows and stuff like that. Well, like, I was in shape thrower mm-hmm. and, like, playing shape thrower shows, like, I would, drink, I would like, be drinking mm-hmm. and, like, all this other stuff. And, like, obviously, before being sober, I'm like, that was pretty much, like, my nightlife. It's just, yeah. like, if I was going to play a show, I'm going to go drink yep. kind of sort of thing. So, like, now just seeing, like, that kind of end of the spectrum or that side of the spectrum where I'm more level-headed and more clear-headed, and it's just, like, this is what I should have been doing the whole time. Yeah, I should have been just more focused on the music as opposed to the partying. Yep. And, like, that's what, like, unfortunately, that's the path that I took, like, in my earlier years before, like, IDAT. Like, mm-hmm. I was just partying all the time, just trying to play shows, going to shows, vice versa, whatever you have you. I've... uh this is a crazy comparison to make, so I'll preface it by saying that I know these two things are nothing alike. But yeah. uh, I'm in the same rap conversation we're talking about. Like, I'm fascinated by rappers, and there's a problem with drug abuse in rap communities. And I heard a theory that a lot of this is like when you come from an impoverished community where violence is prevalent, like drug use is popular because everyone's coping with the trauma of people around them that they've lost. And mm. there's this like inherent trauma that is passed on that then facil- or not facilitates that makes drug use so desirable because you're always running from this thing Mm. and i think tour and drug use is a similar thing of like i think it's so lonely and isolating that there's this constant need of like i gotta find something that feels like home and that's where booze comes in that's where whatever your vice comes in Mm -hmm. and i'm fascinated of like how uh yeah i don't know i guess there must be a way to do that in a way that's more healthy to torn away that's more healthy and not fall in these vices Mm -hmm. but the two seem so intertwined to me and it's similar to the way poverty and drugs can often overlap where it's like Mm -hmm. touring just seems like such a a troubling thing as a human so uh, if our if our biology is wired to be living in groups of 40 to 50 people, right? If that's what the, the cavemen were, that's what our caveman biology is designed to do. Like Tor is as far away from that as you could ever get, right? Mm-hmm. Like New York City is one step away from that and touring is 10 steps away from that thing. Mm-hmm. And it just like, yeah, I don't know. I'm always curious of like, yeah, how does that thing get healthier? How do we do that healthier? And uh, yeah, is it that way for everyone or am I the only one who kind of feels that way about it? Um, um, I think that's kind of like a logical way of like observing it because like there's everything, everything starts with the root, mm-hmm. you know, and being a musician, there's good backgrounds and bad backgrounds. Sure. And there's either good trauma or bad trauma that starts someone to be a musician. Mm-hmm. And those traumas don't really get, you know, um, treated over time and Mm -hmm. then that's kind of what brings in the whole alcohol drugs and everything else in the music scene and everything else like that because you're trying to mask all that bullshit that you dealt with to get into the music but now the music is just like a part of you Mm -hmm. it's just creating some it can now create something a lot worse mentally and whatever so like playing and like just like playing out around the and also i think it's the people who who you're with too of course and like that can really just influence you to do good things or do bad things. And over the years, like just being around the people that would just let me do what I wanted to do. And like, if I wanted to get fucked up, they'd let me get fucked up if I wanted to whatever. And just like, if I wanted to like start a fight, they'd just, they'd fight with me. You know, if I wanted to fucking steal something, they would steal something with me. You know, it's just like, which is what you think you want from your boys. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. So like just having, if you have an influence like that, it's just like, it would really, it just it starts stemming different kinds of traumas, but now you're not dealing with what you originally wanted to fix. Yeah. So like now yeah. it's just like every so like it's definitely relatable to what you're saying as far as like the rap community because, well, I, well any kind of sort of music community, sure. Like because yeah, ev- yeah. like everyone does drugs, everyone drinks alcohol. So yeah. like it's not like it's not foreign to yeah. like different people. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one, and I'm always yeah thinking about it as like a yeah like I said I, when I was a kid it was like tour was the goal, yeah, and now yeah. the more I hear it, the more my friends come back from tour and I hear their versions of it. It's like yeah, that's not my life. That's that is a life for a person, and I'm not that person who is wired to yeah. to survive these things. Like I I think I'm much more suited to be here and kind of building a, a, a nucleus I can touch a lot more than this kind of this thing across the universe where it's like, I can't right. really touch any of these places again. I'll, I'll be there. I'll have a good night there, but it's not permanent for me in a sense. Yeah. Um, Cause you're like literally just one millionth of the uh, attraction around, like with like everything else around you. That's like being attracted because yeah. like, again, starting, like starting a band, like 
if you write good songs from the beginning and like really sit down and do that, like I'm going to use Whitechapel, for mm -hmm. instance, they were playing local VFW shows and they were sounded fucking amazing and they yeah. still sound amazing. Yep. And that's what they did. Like, and that's how they were able to be a full time touring band. Yep. And like, it's hard to get to that. And like, it's hard to really develop that with the right people and like the right, like mental state of mind. Yeah. And so, and I'm sure they had their trauma bullshit over the years. Course, like yeah. you obviously hear, hear about Slipknot and their Iowa days. Like I always, I always think about that every time, like there's like a band conflict. I'm like, dude, I'm pretty sure no one else had it worse than I did. So like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, hell yeah, my man. I appreciate that. Uh, episode 46. We fucking did it, dude. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of shit. Brandon Boomer, uh, <laughs> we fucking made it this far. Uh, anything, found it. Hell, hell yeah, yeah dude. Uh, anything people should know before they get out of here. So I know you're not on social media, which is a unique piece. Normally I have people tell me where to find on Instagram, but yeah, fuck uh, that shit. I guess you are 100% on the money on that. Uh, but I guess go follow Euclid online, go follow Euclid on the band. YouTube. I'm going to give you some uh, show dates right oh, now. Please, dude, give me all the show dates we got coming up and also Edict as well. All right. Um, so Edict, um, we just released, um, it's a pre release of our EP. Or a uh, single. It's called. Um, oh, geez, I have to go to this shit. God, didn't do my research. See, Unbelievable. Always, always do your fucking research. Yeah. Folks. So in the, it's an EP called "In the In the Defense of Labor" or "In Defense of Labor." Um, we dropped a music video, "Neck Dissection," uh, which got streamed on Notfest. So go Notfest.com. So Rips. go check that out. Hell yeah. Um, and so shows got some shows. Um, Let's see with edicts. God, I know this is terrible. So we're anyway, making it happen, you, dude. dude. <laughs> we got shows coming up with edicts. Uh, I'll also interject that I know your hat is a Euclid hat. Uh, oh, yes. So we got the new Euclid merch that I will, yeah, step in and plug for you guys. Uh, all the new, new merch came out. I got a T-shirt. I haven't worn it yet. I don't think. Um, Why? But it's coming. Dude, do you, I'm do you usually it. do you usually wash your shirts like before you wear oh, them, like yeah. new stuff? Oh yeah. Oh yeah yeah yeah. That's so weird. Yeah. So edict show we got a uh, December second. Uh, it's a holiday toy drive with Downswing, Huge. Oak Heart, Ghost Ship, and Concrete. That is at uh, Empire Underground in Albany. Huge. And then December 3rd, uh, we're playing the Sunday Hardcore Matinee. Uh, I can't see where it is. Oh, it's in Florence, Mass. <laughs> uh, with these bands, I can't read the name. Oh, is that Choke Out or Clock Out? I don't know. I can't read it. Hell yeah. Um, so I got those two dates. And then... We got December 15th. That just got announced. Well, not got announced. We just got mm -hmm. added to December 15th at O'Brien's in Alston. And then a bunch of other dates up until January. We are touring with Retha Tongues awesome. late January. And then that's the Euclid show that I can't play in New Jersey with Signs of the Swarm. Yep. Uh, definitely go check that out. And, uh, yeah, go buy our merch. Support local bands. Uh, Hell oh, yeah. No. yeah. Uh, Euclid, all the band stuff on social media. Edict, I assume, is also on Instagram, Facebook, all the all yeah. the places. Yeah. Um, so social. go look at those places for stuff. Uh, hit me up for music videos in the next year. And tell Boomer he's cool. Uh, I'll have to, I like to have people have a way to contact you to tell you that they watch the show. But I'm realizing I'm not just going to give out your email and your phone number here. So, so I, have a your... I have a YouTube channel. Okay. If you want to go on my YouTube channel. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Leave a comment on his YouTube channel. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you my YouTube. I think it's just B-O. <laughs> just B and then O-H. Hold on. Let me go look at that real quick. <laughs> Can't yeah, be it's real. B, it's B-O-H. <laughs> All right. Cool. Let's see if we can get anyone to his YouTube channel. Uh, Mission accomplished. Episode 46 in the bag. Thanks for coming through. Uh, if you made it this far, leave a like on the episode. Comment, like, subscribe. All those things do help. I hate asking for them. But man, does it feel good. Makes my brain go burr when I see those numbers go up. Hell yeah. So send me those numbers. Hell yeah. Mission accomplished. Episode 46 in the bag. See you folks soon. See you.